the Street Society. And uh, we sponsor them to come over to Victoria for two or three days and present to as many schools as we can fit in. And uh, talking about um, sexual exploitation, bullying, uh, gang affiliations, and, and a number of, of internet and cell phone uh, type issues that come up for, for youth, uh, which if you talk to them about those issues, they may often think they aren't really an issue in their lives. But then when they see these interactive plays taking place, they go, oh yeah, I've seen that happen. And yes, that is a, you know, what do you do when that happens? Um, so it's about informing youth. It is offered for youth in the schools um, to all the schools that have chosen to sign up for a presentation. Um, but it's also important, I think, for uh, us as uh, councils and community decision makers to be aware. Um, so we're, we're presenting it at the Family Court Committee, and you're welcome to attend and uh, participate in um, seeing some of the presentation. And it's pretty uplifting just to see the youth um, who are able to put on such amazing um, shows. Um, if you have an opportunity, you might be able to join in and see it in one, a, a local school. Um, but this is an opportunity at lunchtime, uh, if you happen to be downtown, where you could nip out and have a look-see at what we're bringing forward. So there's no RSVP, it's just a case of, if you're in the area, drop on in. Um, two announcements, thank you letters that we've received, one from the Vancouver Island South Film and Media Commission, thanking uh, City of Colwood for their grant of $500 to support the work of bringing film and television productions to the CRD. And you will see on our agenda this evening we have an item there for discussion that uh, is relative to this, so it's, it's working already. Um, the other one is from the D.A.R.E. program, empowering BC's school children to choose a drug-free life. Council um, topped up their required budget in order to meet their um, needs for this year. So with a grant of $780, they are happy and, and um, congratulating us for our generous donation. It is also Police Week, May 10th through 17th. Uh, West Shore RCMP did hold an open house this weekend, so I'm hoping that m I've heard that there were many engagements there for, for it, so I'm hoping that there was lots um, that attended from our area as well. Um, and then the other one that I have is we're in receipt of the a letter from the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators to point out um, that they have a long service recognition awards program that recognizes and celebrates the dedication to public service and municipal management of the members, which is a significant priority. They are granted at 10 and given 10 years and given in five year increments. So this evening we'd like to acknowledge that our newly arrived uh, CAO, uh, James Muller has been awarded a 15-year municipal service pin from CAMA. So we'll get you again in five and five. Um, and that's it from my end of thing. It was a really busy weekend this weekend uh, with Mother's Day painting going on at Royal Roads and Chinese um, contingencies arriving to tour the the city area and that sort of thing so i think i was i don't think i had much time off over the weekend this one uh, moving forward to item number four adoption of minutes of the regular meeting of council april 28th Move adoption. second all those in favor Opposed? Motion carried. Receipt of a set of minutes from Colwood Cycling and Advisory Committee on April 7th. Parks, Recreation and Culture on April 22nd. Planning and Land Use, April 15th. Transportation and Public Infrastructure, April 7th. Move receipt, Your Worship. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, item number five is a presentation we have here this evening with us. Um, administration from Pacific Center Family Services. Uh, Mitzi, if you uh, um, need the podium there, I think, I can't tell if the light's on on the, is it on? Can you hear me? Good. Yeah. Okay. Already. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mayor and Council, thank you very much for sending the invitation to us to give a presentation to you tonight. I know my time is short and um, I'm very passionate about what I've come to talk to you about. Um, so I really just want to raise some particularly key points. Um, PCFSA Pacific Centre Family Services Association, as you know, has been serving the community for over 46 years. We'll be celebrating our 46th AGM in June this year. We, um, we serve a 1,000 individuals in any given year, and uh, we are a, an, a professional accredited high-quality service. We have received international accreditation um, on four occasions for the maximum of three years. Today, I'm here to talk to you about the COPE program. That is our Community Outreach Prevention and Education Program. This is a program that has been in existence since the very early 1980s and has served thousands of youth in the community since then. It was originally designed as prevention intervention for youth to divert them from antisocial behaviors. It was a partnership with protective services. It actually originated and was conceptualized in a partnership with the police authorities in Colwood and in Langford. And the purpose was to develop pro-social activities thereby diverting youth away from coming to the attention of the services, not only police, but also the fire department, as a result of fire setting, for example. These symptomatic antisocial behaviors are actually indicators to us of other dysfunctions and traumas that these youth have, have experienced and need professional services to address. Our current protective services partners actually still agree with this approach of investing some money in prevention services and targeting youth in our community. The program delivers individual counseling as well as outreach with youth. We work with families and we work with groups. We offer alternative methods of reaching out to youth, for example, email counseling. And we know that youth approach us using email who would not otherwise walk through the door to a traditional counseling service, or who we may not otherwise be able to reach as we're doing our outreach. In the past 12 months, from April 2013 to March 2014, in our COPE program, we received 79 new referrals for individual service. That's an increase of 70% on the previous year. 37% of the youth that we served in the past year were registered as Colwood residents. We served 70 individuals, and 37% of those were from Colwood. In addition to that, we have offered parenting groups for parents. We have actually offered boys' groups and girls' groups, the youth email counseling, and we've been able to be nimble with our service delivery. For example, when a youth was accidentally fatally killed in an accident, um, in the past year, we were able to pull together a grief session for the community. And we had um, many youth plus the parents of the, uh, the dead boy attend that session as well. As I'm sure you're all aware, PCFSA offers a continuum of services. And so across that portfolio, we're able to support youth not only through COPE, but to be able to add strength to the services that we offer to youth because we have the COPE program embedded within our whole range of programs. We're a West Shore-based organization, and many of our contracts are prioritizing West Shore families. So we understand the local trends. We understand the local issues. We know, for example, what the local child, youth, and mental health youth um, service wait times are. It's 12 months for youth who are referred today. We know about the key issues around alcohol and drug use amongst our youth. We know about couch surfing, for example. So we tailor our programs specifically, and we can meet youth in Colwood at the place where they need service. Our contract with Colwood, as we're all aware, is up for renewal. And it's extremely important to the youth and the families and the whole community of Colwood. Without this, some youth in Colwood would not receive a service at the time that they need it and prevent continuing harm and dysfunction for them. The youth who receive the COPE program through the investment of Colwood are diverted from antisocial behaviors. They increase their pro-social behaviors. And therefore, there is overall improved functioning for community now and in the future. 
I have sent a report, I've sent a paper documenting in more detail with research and evidence, the arguments to support that. In addition, we've seen a reduction in services in our community in West Shore. As I said, it's a 12-month wait list for ministry-funded um, child, youth and mental health services. In addition, through the funding of the COPE program, over the past three years, we have been able to leverage funding from other sources, including the City of Langford, District of Highlands, District of Machosan, Victoria Foundation, TELUS, Island Savings Credit Union, Provincial Employee Community Services Fund, and Colwood Rotary. In addition, through partnerships of resources, for example, with School District 62, and the support of the Children's Health Foundation, where our program is located. That total is approximately 62,000. In addition, Pacific Centre Family Services Association has invested approximately 61,000 of our independent funds. This program is extremely important to youth in our community today and for the next 30 years. And to finish, I would like to end with what they tell us about the program and how it matters to them. One youth told us, I loved that I felt I wasn't alone, no matter what, and that I had someone to talk to. Thank you very much. Second. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, the letter is an explanation um, from the ministry it, uh, to detail the plans and, and the reasons around uh, closing of the youth custody centre that is situated in View Royal, adjacent to us here. Um, I'm sure everybody's read that. And just since that announcement was kind of sprung out there. There's a number of organizations and, and groups ranging from former judges, um, police, uh, social workers, uh, First Nations groups have weighed in. Um, there's been a, a considerable um, input of, of request by the, the public to look at uh, revisiting this. Um, there was a motion that was passed around, um, sort of circulated within the uh, 13 municipalities. And to date, as of the weekend, I believe there was 12 that have actually indicated that they would take it forward to their councils. So this is a draft um, of a resolution that fits um, closely to Colwood's um, situation. I had Councillor Day provide some wording in here. She's a long-standing member of the uh, Victoria Youth um, or the uh, Family Youth and Family Court Justice Committee. So, to ensure that the wording. Uh, covered off on on everything so it is before you it is only a draft um, if members of council see that we need to add or take away or have question be happy to take that um, into consideration we I've worked there in that facility for 10 years um, and know firsthand the impact that moving kids out of their area has on families and has on their support and their ability to get their feet under them and get back um, uh, into some sort of programming and, and straighter supervision. So um, with that, I'm going to leave it with Council to discuss. Questions? Councillor Day? 
just wonder um, if we should read out the um, draft resolution and I could do that if that would be helpful to anyone or we can certainly do that um, it's a long one it's a draft wording for council resolution citing cost savings and underutilization as the rationale the provincial government has recently announced the proposed closure of the Victoria Youth Custody Services Centre, located in the town of View Royal. And whereas this is the only provincial youth custody facility in, on Vancouver Island, a closure will result in all offenders remanded or sentenced from Vancouver Island courts being removed from their families and community supports to custody facilities on the Lower Mainland or elsewhere in the province. And whereas there are no custody facilities for women on Vancouver Island resulting in all female offenders who are remanded or sentenced from Vancouver Island courts may be temporarily held in local police cells and subsequently removed from their family and community supports to custody facilities on the Lower Mainland or elsewhere in the province. And whereas the Capital Regional District, 13 municipalities, three school districts, appoint representatives to sit at the Victoria Family Court and Youth Justice Committee to be aware of the circumstances for youth and families who may come into contact with the youth and family court system, and the family court, Victoria Family Court and Youth Justice Committee has expressed great concern at the closure of the female youth detention facilities, and whereas reasonable access to family and community supports is integral for rehabilitation planning for Vancouver Island youth and women in custody, Therefore, be it resolved that on behalf of Mayor and Council, Council directs staff to write a letter to the Ministry of Children and Family Development requesting that the Victoria Youth Custody Services Centre remains open and, f and further that the provin provincial government cons re con uh, consider repurposing as part of this facility to include female offenders remanded in custody from Vancouver Island Courts. Councillor Cullington. Thank you. Question for clarification. In the fourth paragraph at the end, where it says closure of the female youth detention facilities, should that say, is that not all youth detention facilities? I, th I think where that came from, they, they had closed the female section of the uh, youth family court, okay. um, what, two years ago? One year ago, year exactly. Ago? Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, so this so refers to a history. Yeah, it's really, okay. it, yeah, it's just in relationship to that. Anyone else? So I'll just move the resolution, Your Worship. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Madam Mayor, just a follow up question. Um, mm -hmm. This is worded uh, like a resolution that would go to the Union of British Columbia Municipalities. So um, I just wanted to clarify if Council uh, would like us to bring this back when we get a response um, from uh, the Ministry. When we write to them, they will probably write back to us and then consider if, if there's no satisfaction, will we bring this to UBCM? I understand that the the initiator of, of this has that in their plan, so it's just a matter of waiting for the results to come through from each of the communities that support it. Um, so it takes care of 6162. Uh, item number seven, Protective Services Committee report, Fire Chief, in regards to the review and approval, alternative approval process for snow curl number 57. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council. This is a review and approval of the altern alternative approval process Snorkel 5-7 replacement. <laughs> At their meeting of April the 14th, 2014, Council approved the funding and tendering of a new replacement fire truck by way of a five-year lease renewable for a second five-year term through the Municipal Finance Authority for the replacement of Snorkel 5-7. In order to be able to enter into such a lease agreement, Council is required to seek the approval of its residents through an alternative approval process, AAP, which provides the registered electors of the City an opportunity to petition against Council's decision to fund the purchase through a lease agreement. A successful AAP would indicate the dissatisfaction of Colwood residents to fund the purchase of the replacement 
fire aerial apparatus through a lease agreement with the Municipal Finance Authority. This report deals with the approvals of the public notices, elector response form, and timeline for the alternative approval process. In preparation for the alternative approval process, administration staff obtained a current provincial voters list from Elections BC and confirmed continued property ownership for those properties that have an individual registered as a non-resident property elector to make a fair determination of the total number of elector responses required to prevent council from proceeding to borrow without an assent of the electors. The advertisements and APP elector response form have been worded according to strict resident engagement guidelines required under the community charter, section 175, and municipal finance authority rules for short-term lease borrowing. Staff recently reviewed the current provincial voters list and the list of registered non-resident property electors and it was determined that 10% of the city's electorate is 1,210. This is the minimum number of elector responses required by the deadline in order to defeat council's approval to borrow without the assent of the electors. Legisla legislation requires that the public notice of intention to borrow is to be published in the local newspaper, Goldstream News Gazette, by way of two consecutive advertisements. As part of the final approval to proceed with the purchase, Council will be required to receive a report on the outcome of the alternative approval process and to formally adopt the results by motion and order to complete the terms required by the Municipal Finance Authority to receive consent to authorize the requested funding. A short report providing the results of the counter petition will be presented to the Protective Services Committee and Council for their information and receipt once the deadline for the process has been reached. The cost of advertising for the alternative approval process has been planned for and will be funded through the Fire Department operating budget in 2014. Further financial information will be presented for approval upon the completion of the alternative approval process and the successful tendering of the project. Recommendations. The following recommendations are presented for Council's consideration. A. That based on the most current provincial voters list obtained in April 2014 and a current list of registered non-resident property electors combined, 10% of the total number of electors of the City of Colwood required to petition Council to submit this matter to the electors for assent to be established as 1,210. And that the two public notice of intention to borrow advertisements presented to Council at the regular meeting of Council on May the 12th, 2014 be approved as presented and the two consecutive dates to publish the notice in the Goldstream News Gazette be approved as May the 21st, 2014 and May the 28th, 2014. And that the alternative approval process elector response form presented to Council at the regular meeting of Council on May the 12th, 2014 be established as the official elector response form to be used for the purpose of the alternative approval process undertaken to borrow funds by way of a lease through the Municipal Finance Authority for the replacement of Fire Snorkel 57, and that the deadline for submitting the response forms be established as Monday, June the 30th, 2014 at 4.30 p.m., and that the alternative approval process elector response forms be made available to the public at Colwood City Hall from the time of the first newspaper publication, May the 21st, 2014, until the deadline. And that a report on the outcome of the alternative approval process be provided to the Protective Services Committee and to Council to formally receive the results of the process. Thank you. Conversation? I move the recommendation. Second. 
Councillor Lukens. Thank you. Um, I have no problem with the recommendation. I guess my question is around um, what the public notice looks like. And I know previously in Council, earlier on in our mandate, uh, we had uh, opportunity to listen to some TED Talks and being creative about how we put out some of these things rather than the boring old, same old, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know if there's an opportunity to do this creatively and get the message across or, you know, so that people will actually pay attention to it and potentially read it or if we have to stay the status quo. But I thought I would ask because I know it's something we talked about. Maybe go to staff to answer the protocol in these kind of announcements. All of the information that's provided in the advertisement is actually legislated. It tells you exactly what you have to communicate to the public, and so that's what we've done. Yeah, and I understand that, and it's the same with the planning, you know, notices about rezoning and stuff. I just, I can't remember who did the TED Talks about the um, the uh, notices that we put out and being creative so that we did things outside, think outside the box as opposed to the status norm. I'm not saying that we don't have any, shouldn't include any of this information, but can we do it differently? I don't know, uh, different layout or something. I don't know, but just rather than the status quo, I don't know how much thought has been given to it because it's, I know it's busy. I think the only thing to keep in mind is we have to say what we have to say. If council does want to do as uh, is being suggested, it just adds to the advertising cost. But if that's a cost that council feels uh, is uh, worthwhile, then that's certainly something that we can look at. Anyone else? Councillor Day? I'm just, um, I'm just a little concerned that um, there are other things that I think we should be creative with. This isn't really one of them um, because the alternative approval process is really designed to to give some very legal rights to um, the electorate so that they could voice their opposition, that there's no chance that anything is going to be, um, you know, slipped through that they're unaware of. So um, I just know that I've learned in my um, uh, challenging situations that I've been through while I've been on council, uh, that it's important um, that there, there's sometimes unintended consequences. So where I thought maybe I had gone above and beyond and, you know, maybe instead of just telling the people who live in this one area, I would, you know, that the people on the next street might want to know. Well, then the next time something comes up, there's an expectation has been created that it's not just the one street that's going to be informed, it's it's other people. And if you don't do it the next time, then people are going to ask you, why not? So um, I think it's uh, because it has a budgetary impact uh, and because this is not, um, you know, I, I think we should um, think outside of the box and be very creative in our announcements. I just think this one isn't the one. Councillor Cullington. Thank you. Um, I was also going to, to raise the kind of how easy is it to, to read the public notice, and I know that a lot of members of the public will look and say, an alternative approval, what? <laughs> what you know, what is that anyway? Um, but, you know, and I totally take in um, from our Director of Administration that we've got to do what we've got to do. Um, but I'm assuming what we can also do is use our website, use the wonderful Sandra to um, help us to kind of create something that's nice and simple to understand. Includes a wonderful picture of the fire truck, <laughs> so people know what they're getting, um, and and just kind of helps communicate in a nice, friendly way, as as well as making sure we're covering off the bases that we have to. And with that stealing of thunder, um, <laughs> is with those notifications, would it be possible to just include, you know, a website notification? On, on the public notice itself, it's only a one-liner. The advertisement in the Gazette could have something in there that directs the public to visit the city's website, yeah. and then the website could be where we have more creative information, perhaps. Absolutely. Okay, Pat. <laughs> public question. Then, all those in favor? Opposed. Motion carried. 
Uh, transportation and public infrastructure, 7.2.1 memorandum um, regarding support coordinator for Grace Point Productions applica filming application. It looks wonderful, but it didn't come to committee, so I'm going to bump it back to Michael. Oh. Yeah, so this uh, seems like a fairly simple um, a filming operation uh, where they just want to uh, bring a, a rowboat ashore, take something out of the rowboat, <laughs> and row back out again. Uh, no helicopters or fireworks or anything like that involved. Uh, but they do want to do it at night, um, and although most of their vehicles will be parked, off uh, the peninsula um, in, a, in a holding um, area to the north. Um, they do need to, to bring some vehicles down onto the peninsula and uh, they're not allowed to park them there between 1 a.m. and 5, 6 a.m. And it, so in order to do this, and I gather this is a night shot and will take several hours to complete despite its simplicity, um, they, they need the the municipality to waive the parking restrictions on the peninsula for that evening um, in order to be able to complete the night shot. And uh, we've provided a recommendation if council wishes to do that. Councilor Day? Just a question, are they aware of the sensitive nature of the dunes and the dune grasses and they're going to stay off of our restored planting areas? Yes, Nora and Kevin uh, held the meeting with them and explained that to them. And I'm uh, recommending that we provide some markers uh, so that they can identify where they can go and where they can. So, and would there be any enforcement involved? Um, I, enforcement of that? Yeah, checking to see that they are staying where they're supposed to be. I, I, I think that's probably not worth the cost um, since we'd have to pay overtime for somebody to be out there at night. Um, given that uh, uh, film productions are usually pretty professional, especially at this level, and the last thing they want to do is um, create a situation where they're not welcome back again. Anyone know? Stop. Just uh, speaking to uh, the recommended motion to council, uh, the hours between 7 p.m. Tuesday, May 27th, and 5 a.m. Wednesday, May 28th. I'm just wondering if council may consider changing that latter time to 6 a.m. to coincide or coincide with our bylaws. So if they they do overrun that, there's not an issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just following up on that, actually, I wonder if we want to um, add some flexibility in there in case the weather is the pits and filming has to be delayed or, you know, there has to be another night uh, instead of having to come back to the city and to council for, uh, for another day. We can just kind of leave that flexibility in there somehow to address... Uh, can, yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, there has to be some notification, obviously, but, but instead of having to come and get a formal motion from council in two weeks time or longer maybe further uh, approval uh, given the the situation if uh, weather plays a significant factor in delaying the production of this film that uh, perhaps uh, the CAO uh, is charged with that task of approving and notifying council thereafter something to that effect So I would move the recommendation with all of its variants and also ask that we formally notify um, Elsie and obviously put the information up on our website as well so that local residents get some information. Second. Any further discussion? Um, just to note, there is a trailer online now in, that they've developed on the first uh, part of the of this Grace Point series. It's a 10-part ten, ten series that will be starting in the fall, so it gives you a little bit of an idea of the gist of the storyline and where it's going and that sort of thing. Still so. Jensen involved? No, I didn't see him in it when I, when I looked through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Councillor Martin had his hand waving there. Yeah, no, I wasn't waving. Uh, it's just uh, I wouldn't mind having uh, people who live around the lagoon notified just because I, I know the camera lights 
are going to be up and that's going to cause concern to people like there's somebody drowned or something that it would just be nice to so people aren't panicking thinking something bad is happening down there so yeah so uh, is there any way that we could have the film crew um, just send a letter to the lagoon area I believe that uh, I, yeah I saw that letter <laughs> but I just didn't know if they're actually going to be doing a, a household delivery to all those people like cause, I mean I would argue that probably majority of people who live down there aren't going to be looking at the LC website to discover if what's going yeah. on. Yeah. It'll be on our website, I think. Yeah. 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 I'm just thinking it would be a good idea. Yeah. I mean, when when sorry when when they filmed uh, X Men, we we just got a letter saying the helicopters were going to be coming overhead three nights yeah. in a row and and that kind of thing. And that was just nice to know. Yeah, so, I think we'll have to inform all the way up to the top of Hatley Park Road. Because all of those people can see yeah. the, the peninsula, yeah. So we'll we'll make sure they do that. Okay. We could perhaps also use our roadside sign. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Use the roadside sign. Yeah. They, yeah. No. Uh, well, and the only worry I have about that is this: sometimes the film crew wants to keep it sort of secret. They they, they ha their signage is sometimes very cryptic, like when they're filming down at uh, at uh, Fort Rod Hill. Mm -hmm. um, so. Because they don't want a whole bunch of looky loos down there either, right? So uh -huh. I don't know if we want to be letting the whole public know. <laughs> but well, and the final other question is: Are they planning on closing Ocean Boulevard, f like for traffic, so that there's no cars driving by while they're filming that scene? They haven't expressed any concern about noise, so I imagine the sound will be dubbed in later. It, it does say that they would accommodate visitors their best as possible. So I just yeah. yeah Will you get you down there with your speed camera? <laughs> anyway, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, motion carried. Did you have some? Oh, I'm sorry. You okay? Oh, di oh well, there you go. It's a lot of that tonight. 7.2.2, uh, Cascadia Green Building Council, Victoria Living Community Design Competition. Um, will that be you, Councillor? That would be Clinton. me. Uh, uh, TPI had a delegation from Cascadia Green Building Council who have been paying close attention to, to what's happening with um, wastewater management in our region. Um, and they had been to Esquimalt Council previously and put a proposal on the table to do a, a design competition, um, which Cascadia do from time to time. Um, this one to look at a... a a hypothetical redesign um, of Esquimalt Village, which um, the township is looking at doing in any case, and incorporating into that design for a, <coughs> a tertiary resource recovery, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, wastewater treatment plant, um, very much along similar kind of thinking that, that we're looking at doing. <coughs> excuse me, at the Juan de Fuca site. Um, so the the group were looking for um, support from council on this project. Um, I think they would have loved to have seen us come forward with financial support, but we, we did say, you know, we're, we've done our budget process and, and our money probably is going into our project. Um, but uh, committee recommended, and I would so move, that council provide a letter of support to Cascadia Green Building Council for the Esquimalt Village Living Community Competition. Second. And I would also say that um, they had a, a kickoff workshop on Saturday, uh, which I attended with, quite well attended by um, a number of residents, including, interestingly, our former CAO. Um, and uh, so lots of good discussion going on and interesting ideas flying around the place. So. Once removed. Um, Seconder on that one? Yeah, Any comments, questions? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, item 7.2.4, or <coughs> pardon me, 7.2.3, Esquimalt Lagoon Bridge. Esquimalt Lagoon Bridge, always a favorite topic. Um, so, as you all know, we get um, and Stantec to do an inspection of the bridge every five years. Um, just so that we know what's going on, what maintenance is needed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they came through again this time with a, a very long detailed list of um, all of the stuff that, that needs to happen on the bridge, what needs to happen, 
sooner rather than later and, and what we can afford to, to leave for a little bit longer. Um, the good news is that so far they're saying the current load restriction and speed limit can be maintained. Um, but they did note that the channel below the bridge, as we all know, has changed considerably um, since they last looked at it in 20, 2008. Um, it's quite a bit lower on the, the north side and, and similarly higher on the uh, south side um, because of all the, the um, movement that's been going on down there. Um, quite a number of the repairs could be done by our public works department and, and you have a, a long list there in front of you of, of some of the things that they're recommending. Um, we have in, City has in its budget for 2014 a budget of 32,500. That is for all bridge repairs in the city. However, if you remember, we did uh, the major work on the Colville Creek bridges last year, so we can really pretty much dedicate all of this to uh, the Lagoon Bridge for this coming year. Um, but we will need to look at putting some additional money into the, the budget for 2015 to complete the work um, that was, was recommended. Um, there were a number of members of the Peninsula and Lagoon Supporters Group, sometimes known as PALS. Um, we involved them in the inspection process, so they came along with Stantec, um, had an opportunity to provide some direct input into that, um, and the Stantec report did respond to some of the comments and concerns uh, that they made. Um, the group at the meeting did um, raise the issue of um, wanting to see reinforcement to, to go this bit. Um, as being critical to, uh, in their opinion, critical to the protection of the bridge. Um, however, what we tried to do is to, to note that this particular recommendation focuses only on the bridge maintenance um, and that what council has done is recommended that we're still going to be moving forward on that consultant's report um, later on the, in the year that's going to be looking at uh, the first priority, which is protection of the pump station. Um, and then moving out from, from there. So although we recognize the, the importance of that conversation, um, the, the recommendation focuses simply on the bridge maintenance, um, which Council has previously stated, and I hope is continuing to state, is, is still a priority. Um, So it was recommended by committee and I so move that public works with direction from the appropriate engineers carry out as many as possible of the repairs to the Esquimalt Lagoon Bridge in the 20, Stantec 2014 report as can be done within the current 2014 budget, that the north abutment piles be excavated and probed under the direction of a structural consulting engineer in 2014 with the cost to be paid for from the 2014 bridges maintenance budget item and that staff repair estimates for the 2015 budget considerations for all other repairs to the Esquimalt Lagoon Bridge as recommended in the Stantec 2014 that cannot be completed within the 2014 bridges budget. Second. Comments, questions, Councillor Day? Thank you. Uh, the um, bridge report that was done uh, for all the bridges in Colwood, uh, I believe also identified uh, bridge work that needed to be done in Latoria Creek Park. And um, so I'm just, uh, in terms of directing all of the budget to this one item, I'm just wondering where that leaves the other bridge work. There, there is actually separate money that has been budgeted um, each year to do one or two of those from that previous report. And I believe that this is the last year, um, and I can't actually remember offhand which bridges are still to be done. Um, could be the Latoria ones, but uh, there is separate uh, money budgeted for that and it will all be completed this year. Because the wording of the budget sounds like all monies from, from the bridge repair budget are going to this one item, uh, which I think leaves the other bridges without any funding. No, it's, uh, this, this is uh, this, the normal um, bridge funding budget. The, the bridge maintenance budget, but we had separate, uh, um, I believe it's capital money uh, for the other repairs. There is a, there is a separate budget for the, the other repairs tonight. Yeah. The, the other bridges will not be ignored in order to do this. Okay. Uh, All right. That seems um, different than what the wording of the motion is, though, because it, it says... 
I carry out as many as possible the repairs in the Square Mutt Lagoon Bridge as can be done within the current budget. Okay, maybe it was said previous. Paid from the 2014 bridges maintenance budget item. So it doesn't say Lagoon Bridge maintenance budget item. It says bridges budget item. So I would just like clarification for the other. Do we have two bridge maintenance funds or one? I believe there's one specific citywide bridges budget, but the report is speaking to the budget that applies to the Lagoon Bridge only. I'm sorry, but that that doesn't then that doesn't make any sense to me. That's leaving that's taking all of the budget and using it for this one bridge this year then doesn't on, leave any money for the other bridge work. On page three of four, uh, third paragraph down, it says 32,500 has been allocated for all the bridges in Colwood, and as work has been done on bridges in Colwood, most of the funds will go to towards the Lagoon Bridge. Staff? May I suggest that we could solve the problem uh, by adding without uh, neglecting the work required on other bridges? Um, so within um, item okay, add, adding, uh, Kate, then I would propose that amendment to number one, um, with add, add the words at the end without neglecting other bridge maintenance. Call the question on the amendment, or a seconder on seconder on the amendment. Call the question on the amendment. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Um, and then back to the main motion, then. And uh, just a question, if I may, uh, about the, um, there was some discussion about the sea level rise at, at the committee, and there was a presentation at ABICC, not this year, but last year, and where it was put on by the province with regard to anticipating a one meter sea level rise. And uh, I'm just wondering if we have uh, developed any um, plans or protocols um, in response to that. That, uh, that will be part of the work that um, the consultant uh, will provide us with um, in considering the pump station. That will be the first one. And then subsequently with the other uh, uh, endangered assets. Councillor Lukens. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I was at the meeting, and um, I know that the um, PALS people um, were disappointed with the outcome of some of the report, and they, I did talk to them afterwards, and it's evident tonight that they're not here, that they're not feeling like they are heard. And I just wonder if there isn't another way that, um, you know, I know they participated in the process for the... Um, with Stan Tech to go down and uh, look at the bridge and that sort of thing. I'm just wondering if the messaging that isn't coming out and just, you know, wanting to engage people who are um, wanting to contribute from our community. I'm not saying that they're the engineers and that we need to um, or want to um, take that verbatim. I get that. But I just wonder about the engagement process and then when the reports are written that it's at least acknowledged um, to a greater extent that they have been heard because I really feel that they don't feel that they have been somewhat like we felt with the CRD when it came to sewage. They just weren't hearing us. Um, and we kept pounding on the wall. But just my opinion based on what I heard at the meeting and their sense afterwards and just reading the report again. And I know there is some tie-in and I know Helen was away and didn't respond to them. And I have seen the responses of Helen to their queries um, since that meeting. But just going forward, I know they put a lot of time in and a lot of effort, and I know that you've spent time with them as well, the engineering department, Michael. So just when we bring it out into the public, I think that engagement and integration is important. Thank you. <laughs> Go. I have actually set up a meeting with them for when I come back from holidays, uh, which, by the way, start on Thursday. What, it's when? Thursday. I'll be gone until the end of the month from Thursday. 
Yeah, we've set up the meeting for June. I think that's a recent. Yeah. Anything else? Call the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, item 7.2.4 options for expanding the sewer system. Um, <laughs> we have so many favorite topics in this city. Um, so again, hopefully you all remember um, seeing the sewer master plan, which kind of gave us in glorious detail um, how we could uh, expand our sewer system to reach every single property in the city at a, at a cost of ooh, about $50 million. Um, so, you know, what we obviously did then is sort of said, are there kind of obvious places that, that we should go first and, and how should we look about beginning this process? Um, one of the things that, that we recognized at, at committee is that actually the first thing we need to do is to sort out how we're going to deal with sewage treatment in this city because we don't want to go about um, inviting a lot of people to, to join the sewer system and then all of a sudden they're, they're hit with some enormous fees for, for um, being part of the, the sewer system. Sorry, Rob. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's recognition that the first place to go is actually kind of not to kind of rush out and, and do this, but to, to kind of deal with the sewage treatment, know how we're going to move forward on that one, and then move on from, from there. So um, committee looked at um, some possibilities, um, really focused around how would we slightly expand our sewer system, what are the opportunities there to do that in a way that would really encourage commercial development in key areas of our cities. So in other words, the city would invest money but would see a return on that investment through increased commercial in those areas and, and three areas were kind of put out for consideration. Um, one being Kelly Road, um, pushing it a little bit further away from the Souk Road intersection. Um, also looking at Legend Road coming in from Wishart um, and also sort of along Souk Road east of, of VMP. Um, there was also discussion around extension along Goldstream Avenue, although we're still hoping that, that the development proposed there might take care of, of that one. Um, obviously, you then get into the, the good question of, of where the money comes from for doing this kind of work. Um, we've certainly seen in the past and, and still the ongoing possibility we can get a group of re groups of residents can get together and decide that they want to have a local area service um, and uh, work with us to, to make that happen. Um, there is some borrowing capacity um, to do this, but at this moment in time, we don't know exactly how much we need. Um, we could use general taxation to build or subsidize the building of sewers. Um, or we could look at um, something like the Langford arrangement um, that happened um, with the private sector there, um, although um, I think that that deal has been rather in Langford's favour rather than the private company's favour, so they might not be jumping up and down to, to do that all over again. Um, so the uh, committee looked at various possibilities. Uh, we also talked about the importance of tying this into our economic development strategy, uh, committee recommended, and I was so moved, um, that council direct staff to delay initiating the possible extension of sewers, other than as already planned for the central area and subject to number three below, until the costs surrounding sewage treatment are better known, and then to bring forward proposals as soon as possible thereafter, and direct staff to incorporate plans to extend sewers with the proposed heat utility as part of the Colwood Resource Recovery Centre economic development strategy or any similar proposals elsewhere, and direct staff to bring forward requests from property owners or their agents and groups of property owners for sewer extensions as these are received, and in all of the above, coordinate with the Colwood economic development strategy. Second. Comments from council? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried? Uh, moving then into bylaws, number 1536, final reading for Colwood Sewer Utility Bylaw, number 1500-2011. Move final. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, bylaw number 1469, first, second, and third readings for Colwood Main Sewer Local Area Service Bylaw. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? 
Motion carried. Move second. second. Comments, questions? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Second, third. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Bylaw number 1470, first, second, and third readings, Callwood West Sewer Local Area Service Establishment and Loan Authorization Bylaw. Move introduction. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move second. Second, second. Comments, questions? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move okay. third. Second. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, looking to move in camera? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Thanks, folks. Action. Yeah. And we had our picture taken. What is that little green? No, no, it's just it's an EOS. Look, goof. Ew. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, I know. My daughter got me on them. She was ordering them on the internet. But then here a while back, Costco had them in a five pack. Yeah. <laughs> Four pack or five pack or whatever. So I, hmm? It's called EOS. EOS. Yeah. EOS. 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 Cool. And I saw them at Superstore too. Oh, yeah. The, just the pink and the green. I like the green. So, yeah, it's that not bad. Like the blue one, though, is really good. It's, it's got a refreshing mint oh, yeah. blast to it. It's nice. 